It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 269 at block height 683,879 on Sunday, May 16th. What is up, guys? Elon Musk is a bad, bad boy. Oh, we'll, 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 we'll get to that. We'll, we'll, there, there, there's a whole block for that. I'm He's glad a bad the whole dog. world is catching up on Elon Musk. Hey, dude, you didn't use my random contraption to rescue a kid stuck in a cave. You're a fucking pedo. Win proof of dog. <laughs> I'd say in the interest of getting to that block, though, should we just push through? I will take that as an affirmative. So, I'm Thier, LLP, a law firm from the UK. Ooh, this is a doozy. Um... They're suing 16 Bitcoin core developers. Actually, not even all of them are core developers. Um, some of them are shitcoin devs. Um, some of them haven't contributed to the Bitcoin core code base in years. But um, yeah. Oh, this is so fun. See, the Tulip Trust got hacked. And you see all the Bitcoin in it got, got stolen. But it's in an address from Mt. Gox. That really isn't Mount Gox's address um, that was stolen in the Mount Gox hack. See, it's really Craig Wright's coins because he's Satoshi. Um, so they're suing the core developers um, to, to release a fork of Bitcoin that would just reassign this stolen address from Mount Gox that really doesn't belong to Mount Gox. It's, it's Satoshi's um, to Craig Wright because he's clearly Satoshi. And, you know, Bitcoin, it was always supposed to follow the law. So clearly, if they're Satoshi's coins, the core devs have to hard fork Bitcoin and give him his coins back. Um, yeah. So 16 core developers. Um, I'm not going to name all of them because I'm not sure that that has been made public yet. But um, Peter Todd came forward acknowledging he was one of them. Um, have to put up with this insane, deranged lawsuit. Um, the legal cost to defend themselves because this nutty Australian schizo patient who got out of the nut house thinks that they can just hard fork Bitcoin and give him Satoshi's coins. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, as of course a fake lawyer, he knows all about how the purpose of the law is to force people to do work to give you money that doesn't actually belong to you. I think we should have a lottery because I'd like to put my name into that hat also. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was about to say Bitcoin Cobra said one of the first smart things I've seen him say in years. Um, how come only Craig? I mean, Bitfinex lost like 100,000 plus coins in a hack. How many people have lost their coins over the years? That guy who, whose hard drive ran up in the or <laughs> wound up in the, the dumpster in Britain. Like, what? come on. Why only Craig? Like, everybody should get their coins back, right? I really I, think we should pursue an equity agenda. I believe that Shinobi has taken some coins from me, and I would like them back, too. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. Are you sure? Oh, the blockchain yep. does. Well, the thing is, I can just say that coins are mine, and then they are. Touche. We just all need our own personal forks of Bitcoin. That'll solve this. Craig just needs to get bankrupted. I mean, like, COPA and the lawsuit that they have against him with the whole white paper shit, they need to nail him to the fucking wall. Because it is absolutely ridiculous that core devs have to put up with crazy shit like this. Like, it is absurd. It seems like... Has, the, go ahead. 
Well, I was just going to say, has anyone actually uh, suggested that they argue that he's falsely portrayed himself as a lawyer, which is illegal in the UK? I don't know if that's an actual good argument for this lawsuit, but if it was me, I would bring up that he pretends to be a lawyer and that is not allowed in the UK. Straight up. Why the fuck should he be able to ask anybody else to do a fork for him? The code is sitting right there and he can fork it to his heart's content. Uh, well, hmm. Does he know how to fork code? Nope. He'll get there. There's some how-tos online. Does he even know how to press the fork button on GitHub? I think it's the downloading and, like, extracting the zip file. Like, all of these things are very challenging. Not even sure he knows how to log into websites. I just hope that, like, this gets dealt with quickly. And, you know, at least I would hope for American developers, like, there is some kind of precedent to go, "Uh uh-uh, you're not allowed to troll American citizens with a foreign legal system. But, like, this this is ridiculous. Like... E- even people on this list who I do not have a high opinion of, like they still have spent years of their lives building out and working on this protocol and this system. And now, oh joy, they have to deal with the fucking deranged Australian con man and like have to go to court and spend money on that. Like it- it's ridiculous. Yeah, we fought, a, we fought a revolution for this. Get out. <laughs> if if it is a technical hurdle, Craig, uh, for one virgin Coinbase, I will help you through all of it. Flat fee. <laughs> yeah, let, let's let's just say like, if there is any developer on this list who has financial problems, can't deal with this, like this of all times is the time to start throwing magic internet money across the internet to help with something (laughs) no forking without porking all of these scam um lawsuits seem to originate out of the uk so i really question their legal system at this point i believe most of the uk legal system is wearing wigs and that's about it and lots and lots of powder 90% 90% wig, 5% powder. What's the other 5%? Like tea time? Extraditions. There we go. Yep. Fucking England. Catch up, boys, and uh, kill Tesla stock trading while you're at it. I hear they own Bitcoin. Also, he's an Australian. Come on, UK. I thought you didn't like Australians. Shouldn't he have been extradited back to Australia for tax evasion at this point, given that Australia and the UK have an extradition agreement? Yeah, I I honestly, at this point, I am kind of confused as to why he hasn't gotten in more trouble for his shenanigans, um, either just because he's paid off or someone has paid for some really good lawyers that have managed to keep him out of jail, or, uh, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility that he's... Uh, you know, an actor who is being uh, maneuvered to just be disruptive and cause lots of trouble. Well, let's just say grease balls like him are usually the guys who wind up in a position like that. I mean, basically everything that he's written about screams, I want to work for the state, or he thinks he's worked for the state, so would not surprise me. Mm-hmm. Speaking of states doing stupid things. Yeah, well, in the past couple episodes and in last month's issue of my privacy newsletter, we talked about the IRS making John Doe summons to Circle and Kraken after having previously also made such a request to Coinbase years ago for information on users transacting above a certain threshold. Uh, in order to combat underreporting of uh, taxable events. And this week, uh, Tyler, a.k.a. BTC Ty Burr, wrote for Bitcoin Magazine regarding a report by an Argentinian news outlet that their uh, equivalent of the IRS, the Federal Administration of Public Revenue, AFIP, had decided to require all exchanges operating in the country to identify all of their clients as well as all modifications that occur for all accounts 
uh, so I guess any changes in balances or anything of that nature paired with this massive information grab exchanges must also report total income as well as final account balances to the AFIP by the 15th of every month. Uh, and of course, as the article expands on, this is likely because Argentina is a country that engages in strict capital controls and experienced inflation, especially lately, and driving uh, that is driving a portion of the population to protect their savings in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, uh, like it, as is happening in other countries. And so they just want to stop that because they don't like the fact that their citizens want to protect their money and maybe don't like their national currency. So they are trying to figure out who all those people are so that they can possibly stop them. Because, you know, Argentina has a great history of, you know, things, good things happening to people who get put on lists and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, at this point, this is just becoming like standard news every week or two <laughs> like also was i saying argentina the entire time i'm in argentina yes, yes, yeah i realized that halfway through and i was like wait a second i am i don't know what i think i'm saying but i'm saying it wrong i figured you were just mocking them which is fitting yeah it seems like the governments want to see all whether it's china taking away money from fintechs whether it's the u.s suggesting that banks should file all transaction data down to the penny with the feds every year or now argentina saying monthly we would like the exchange records please well i mean dude like i've been screaming this for forever if bitcoin really is going to do what we think it's going to do then any tax authority with half a brain is effectively going to end up specializing in fucking bitcoiners like if this if this really does become the giant eat everything money of the digital age then it's going to happen it's either that or the tax authorities and governments just bend over and go, have at it. If you're down there, I'd recommend you start looking into things like BISC, maybe Strike, um, whatever ever other local service options you might have. Anything. If you can get your hands on stable coins, like there are a bunch of options to swap and platforms to do that on. But yeah, the game is afoot. So, are we ready for a little oopsie? A little oopsie. Yep. So, um, BIP-125, um, the specification for replace by fee, um, calls for any descendant transaction of a transaction using RBF um, also be replaceable. Um, even though it hasn't explicitly flagged the RBF um, flag because it's descended from a transaction that did. So like I push something with RBF and then before that confirms, I make another transaction. That second one, even if I don't flag RBF, it should be replaceable with RBF. But Bitcoin Core does not actually implement that behavior. So pretty much it will respect RBF for that first transaction, but all of its child transactions, it will not replace them with the RBF logic that it should in the, um, the spec of this. So really, um, most of the issues that this causes are related to second layers. And really, I don't think any of them relate to anything deployed except lightning. Um, but you could kind of play games um, with pinning attacks on HTLC outputs with Lightning um, if you spend a child transaction with that. Because the way the, the logic here works, um, it doesn't require a um, higher fee in order to replace something or to be there in conflict with something. So effectively, you can pull these pinning attacks where you make it um, not possible for somebody to bump the fees um, to get something confirmed in time cheaper because this descendant logic isn't being implemented. 
And um, another interesting thing um, about this is BTCD, um, the Go implementation, um, I think currently maintained by Roast Beef from Lightning Labs, um, was not affected by this and actually correctly implemented the behavior from the spec. Um, so really, um, at the end of the day, this is something I'm not aware of having caused any issues with Lightning or any second layers. Um, and it's not a consensus issue. So this is something that should be patchable and then new clients, mempools will, you know, act with the, the proper logic for this. But, you know, oops. Um, I, I think since like 2015, um, Core has not implemented the child transaction behavior it should have. So, you know, oopsies. This... <laughs> I'm really glad this got found early um, while lightning is still kind of in a growing baby phase because, yeah, th this would have been a very bad thing to find out when a lot more layer twos were getting rolled out and then all of a sudden a behavioral assumption um, in the mempool is wrong. No one's going to make a joke about the Doge devs. Maybe they could help out with this. Do the Doge devs even, or I'm sorry, the do, the Doge dev? Does the Doge dev even know what RBF is? No one knows you're a Doge dev on the internet. <laughs> but, show uh, me the yeah. do, show me the Doge dev, and I will show you a happy dog. We should probably just contact Elon directly on this one. Feel like we should roll through these next two because I think I think we all want to get to the Elon hour. All right, oh god, well, the Elon hour. An hour? Yeah, I'm gonna go walk the dog and then then we'll do the rest of the stories. Um, walk the doge? Yeah. My my doge dev over here. Uh, so, next story. Old Nydig, trying to get a little PR, did a bit of a poll. They polled 1,050 U.S. consumers with an annual income of at least 50 grand. And uh, they came up with some numbers. Their numbers say 46 million Americans now own at least a share of Bitcoin, according to Newsweek. A share of Bitcoin, everyone. That equals about 17% of the adult population of the United States. Uh, other fun numbers in there. Majority, 53%, said they do not own digital assets. But 55% of those said they would consider adding cryptos to their portfolios. Um, I thought this was fun. Just on getting numbers, I would have never guessed 46 million Americans are exposed to a share of Bitcoin. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll see going forward what other polls have to say. Um, one interesting stat that kind of plays into this, there are approximately 46 million millionaires in the whole world, and, and yet 46 million Americans own a share of Bitcoin. So not enough Bitcoin to go around, just not quite enough. Wait, you... Uh you said that they polled people who made at least 50000 annually in income? Correct. Yeah, I mean, wow. it's, hard, it's hard to afford a share of Bitcoin if you don't make at least $50,000. Um, <laughs> so it could be even higher. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. But I'm, I'm, I'm still surprised they got to $46 million off of even polling only people who are making fifty grand plus. Yeah, bro. I mean that that poll would exclude me. <laughs> well, I mean, I just think I never made fifty k. Like even thinking that half of the people who could own Bitcoin weren't even asked there, like that's still a fucking crazy number to me. Like I remember, like the last time I saw a figure like this, I think was like two years ago from Canada, and it was only like five percent of the country. Yeah, seventeen percent is pretty high. I want to say Turkey's running somewhere in the twenties, and uh, I'm trying to remember where Nigeria is at. But they claim an an error margin of plus or minus three point one percentage points on this little poll here, which uh, still seems pretty high. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm like 
I'm in the same boat real quick, Janine, like income wise. So like how many people did they miss? A lot. Well, this is another case of have fun staying poor, guys. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, income is not, you know, you you don't have to be poor and make, you, know, you don't have to make 50000 to not be poor. <laughs> Just saying. I'm saying there might be perks to staying poor. Yeah, there are perks to staying poor. Yeah, I mean, like, think about how many people out there who made less than twenty grand a year, but were scooping up hundred dollar Bitcoin a couple years ago. A <laughs> hundred dollars? How about like five cents? <laughs> they probably are all out on their Caribbean islands and could not be reached for comment. I mean, like. I'd say that kind of percentage, like you're past the point you can make something illegal anymore. Like you're stuck trying to regulate it. Yeah, I, I would have made the argument we were there just on GBTC and the ownership amongst millennials, uh, it being what, like the third most common millennial stock holding or being listed on the CME. Um, and I think we're starting to see that idea of it being illegalized falling away, but it's still referenced every now and again. I mean, what, what, does anyone actually know what the average income for Americans is? Isn't it somewhere around 30, 40 ish? I think on a household basis, it's in the 50s somewhere. Well, yeah, household, but that could be two income, you know. Correct. Like, so I'm thinking more of like individuals. Let's ask the old googly machine. Um, real median personal income, 35K. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know. I feel like if you wanted your study to be at least somewhat fair in terms of including people, I would have just gone with every, I would go, I would have just done at least the average income for Americans, not 50K. Yeah, I wonder how that biases the output because... You should only be able to estimate ownership amongst people who make at least 50k if that's your sample right it would still exclude me i'm below average and everything who knows <laughs> uh, yeah it's could skew up or down i also find it like i don't know who what, where do you who contacts you for these surveys? Because I've never been contacted for one of these surveys. So I am like very butthurt. Well, yeah. I wonder if this is one of those things where you have to own a telephone, <laughs> like a household telephone. Uh, they claim the yeah. survey of a thousand Americans was done by Magnified Money, um, a division of Charlotte, North Carolina based lending tree. Um, maybe mm -hmm. that's a different survey. That's a different survey. Yeah. Usually, I've heard that they do these surveys with um, with voter registration or driver's license information because that's like one of the easiest things to obtain because like the DMV just gives it to everyone. So it's like either you have a driver's license registered or you're a registered voter and they use that somehow. Data were weighted by the age, race, sex, education, and geographic location using the Census Bureau's American Community Survey to track the demographic composition of the United States. Reality, everyone just lied and like almost nobody who answered the phone had Bitcoin. <laughs> the real number's 80%. Everybody's just got really good OPSEC. I'm proud of y'all. We'll never know. All right, though, Janine heard somebody was fucking with Tor again. Yeah, back in August 2020, uh, for that issue of my privacy newsletter, I covered a report about malicious Tor exit relays that were targeting cryptocurrency-related websites. Uh, according to that security researcher, they replaced Bitcoin addresses and HTTP traffic to redirect transactions to their wallets instead of the user provided Bitcoin address. Bitcoin address rewriting attacks are not new, but the scale of their operations is. Uh, and then in January, 
uh, in the January issue a few months ago, I also included information about some Tor network consensus issues that were causing outages among the new version 3 onions. And now, according to a new research piece by uh, the same Nessenu uh, security researcher, the SSL stripping attacks continue. Uh, they are actively exploiting Tor users since over a year and expanded the scale of their attacks to a new record level of over 27% of the Tor network's exit capacity um, being under their control on, I believe this was February 2nd of this year. The average exit fraction this entity controlled was above 14% throughout the past 12 months, measured between, uh, I think this was April 24th and April 26th of this year. Uh, they also include a history of, in the in the post, they include a history of the countermeasures that have been taken over time and whether they were successful, and some guesses about who might be behind the operation. There is mentions of Russia, Russia, so if you care about that. Um, but then they write, uh, towards the end, nonetheless, we are in a dilemma between knowingly using malicious Tor exit relays versus ex excluding them via the Tor client configuration at the price of having a non-default configuration. This is additionally complicated by the fact that the exact nature of the attacks are not entirely known. We know about uh, MITM, I assume man in the middle proxy, SSL strip, Bitcoin address rewrites and download modification attacks, but it is not possible to rule out other types of attacks. Imagine an attacker that runs 27% of the Tor network's exit capacity and a Firefox exploit affecting Tor browser gets published before all users got their auto updates. So just kind of speculating about issues that could come up in the future. Um, yeah, so that stuff is uh, still happening, which is uh, great. So yeah, uh, recommendations they made. One of the top things on the list was uh, if you... Uh, I think F Tor browser has it by default, so you don't have to do anything, but if you use Firefox or Chrome... Uh, or any other compatible browser with the extension, you should have HTTPS Everywhere installed, which will basically, when you go to a website, if it has an HTTPS version available, uh, or SSL available, then that will get, uh, it will basically force the website to use that version with you instead of the unsecure version. Um, just a small easy free extension that you can install, and it has some other options in there that you can actually set it to only uh, load resources that come from HTTPS and not without SSL. That is great. So yeah, there's a few things you can do, but mostly we're just kind of waiting around for Tor to make decisions. And um, yeah, there, there was a lot of writing about how uh, there's like a contact info field uh, and how that was kind of being abused because I guess the attacker was for a while or maybe still is using contact info for cypherpunk labs. Uh, you may have seen them on Twitter offering to run Tor nodes for people like paid, uh, get paid to or pay them to run a Tor node or relay. Um, and I guess the this attacker was spoofing their contact info because there isn't really a hard check on that as far as I know in the in the configuration. Um, don't know if we want to have a hard check on that, but that is also something that they are looking at, I guess. Yeah, it's just kind of amazing to me that this got to the point of a quarter of all exit nodes. I mean... You know, I know people use Tor for a lot of different things, but like if you're worried about stuff like this, follow all of Janine's advice. If you're still worried, like I personally don't use Tor in any way to clear NAT exit. Like if I'm using Tor, it's because it's something internally hosted on Tor. And yeah, I mean, like, I personally don't feel comfortable using Tor any other way these days. Yeah, so that's obviously the other thing you should do is um, when you use Tor, I mean, you can just search the regular clearnet internet with Tor, obviously, and that's what a lot of people do. But if you can, um, if the services that you're using have an Onion service and Tor browser now has this thing where 
Uh, I actually can't remember the name of the feature, but it's this little tag that shows up in the address bar that tells you when you go to a website if they have an Onion service version available, and then you click on, I think it's like Onion onion location, uh, something like that, um, and it tells you whether there's an Onion service version available, you click on it, and it takes you to that, and so any website that has that, you can easily figure it out and go to that, and it will be better for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like almost all of the real nasty attacks on Tor are all on things exiting Tor or the exit nodes. Like if if you just stay within Tor, you, you pretty much have to have somebody who is okay with fucking with the entire global Tor network to, to be able to fuck with you. And that would be obvious. Like that that's Tor's biggest strength in my opinion is that you can make that little subnet where all people can really do is fuck with the whole network to bring it down or try to pull timing analysis attacks both of which are obvious to users when they're going on like or i don't know i mean another solution from the service provider slash website side is for them to instead of just posting up a bitcoin address for you to deposit into like just a text a plain text message they could maybe be sign it with their service key so that when you copy it you can actually check if the key that signed the address actually matches i don't know how practical that is i assume it should be um, but that would also help because then if you check the key and it's not matching, uh, then you know that maybe someone has intercepted it and changed it. Honestly, I just still can't believe that like things still serve shit over plain HTTP these days. <laughs> yeah, well, we can't have nice things. Yep. But seriously, like every, basically every browser that I've used in any long-term context, I always have HTTPS everywhere and a bunch of other extensions installed, like, right away, because otherwise the internet is stupid, and I don't like it. Yep. Alright, guys. Are we ready? I got a beer. <sighs> God damn it. I hate you. I want a beer now. So begins the hour of Elon is a fucking moron. Surprise, because we didn't know this before. <laughs> yeah. How so, to shoot yourself in the foot after spending $1.5 billion. The guy who gets government subsidies and also helped to make PayPal is not a good thinker. How much Doge is on their balance sheet? This is what I want to know. Well, we'll never know because that's the private company. But yeah, Tesla no longer takes Bitcoin for Teslas because fossil fuel. Ah! But they're not going to sell their fucking Bitcoin. Oh, no, 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 no. They're going to hold on to it to transact with when the, the, the energy use by Bitcoin is more green and sustainable. Um, yeah. So this first one, um, I really find it hard to believe he is this stupid. And really a big part of this, like the timing of this, that just seems way too fucking nice and neat, is the renewable credits for, for vehicle emissions that they have for cars that Tesla makes fuck tons of money off of because all the other car companies have to pay them if if they don't meet their um, sustainable electric vehicle quotes under carbon emissions. Um, they have to pay Tesla, who earns fuck tons of these credits because all the vehicles they make are electric vehicles. Um, they want to, to expand that program in states that have these carbon emission mandates to industrial trucks with a higher premium than currently exists for the current electric vehicle ones and oh what no we we can't take bitcoin anymore oh what we're gonna wait until it's more green and sustainable to use the bitcoin that we're not going to sell um yeah th this just screams to me um just pr because they want more fucking money 
from these renewable credits because they would not be a profitable business without them. Like they would be at a loss, not making any fucking money if all the other car companies did not have to pay them for these credits. That's what makes them profitable. So, and, and I might even go so far as to say I could easily see some kind of fucking argument between Iman and the board about just dump all the Bitcoin. Hence the weird, like, um, we're, we're not going to accept it for payments, but we're, we're going to hold on to ours and we'll use it when Bitcoin is more green and sustainable. Well, then why, why don't they dump it? Like the, the whole synchronicity of all of this is just he wants more government subsidies. That simple. Yeah, so Tesla has made more money on buying that Bitcoin and the price appreciation than they've ever made on cars, which is just, you know, interesting tidbit by themselves. Uh, I think they've got some like two quarters of profitability under their belt, and that's even with all the government subsidy stuff in there. Uh, so good job. Um, they have not embraced technologies like LiDAR that everybody else making autonomous, autonomous cars now use. Now, it makes sense that they wouldn't have used it at the get-go just because of how pricey it was, but like all technology, prices come down. And Waymo and Uber and anybody else working on autonomous is now a LiDAR shop because LiDAR gives you much better point accuracy than using cameras and sonar. Um, what else do we got? I think Elon may have gotten scared about ESG funds deciding to pull out around the narrative that he's now acting like he just discovered. So it's it's interesting the thrash here that he could be pro Bitcoin, go all in, of course, uh, get his doge bags pumped as he's he's been the meme lord of that and and kind of focal point for that whole project for some time now, uh, but to turn around on a one and a half billion dollar investment that is the thing that's made you more money than anything else as a company, that's really interesting to me. And I wonder how much that goes with kind of the wokeness and getting poo-pooed uh, as far as should Elon be able to be on SNL and, and that sort of thing. So I, I wonder if this isn't a board play, if this is an ESG type investment stuff, if this isn't, well, maybe they won't let them invest in our stock in Britain anymore. Um, just a whole lot of stuff going on here that, that makes for an interesting cauldron. You know, that's something I didn't even think about. Um, Biden rolled back, um, the OCC, um, position that banks had to stop discriminating on industries over arbitrary shit, like having carbon emissions and shit, didn't he? I haven't heard that. Okay, he might have just wanted to then, but um, yeah. But there are, yeah. there are those mandates that are out there. And, you know, I, I just feel like he's felt a lot of pressure lately. Uh, and the SNL thing kind of showed it off just the public backlash because, you know, most of the people I interact with, they're Elon worshippers because they are smart folks that noticed the narrative, bought the stock and they're way the fuck up. And, you know, that stock has had the highest PE on any exchange for quite a long time because Elon is magic and or his cars are magic. There is no magic in a Tesla. I'm sorry. Um, We've we've had a government that's bad at math, and it's been really evidenced over the last year and a half, um, just at the forefront as far as how to interpret things around the coronavirus. Uh, another way they're horrible at math is suggesting that we can completely divorce ourselves from gasoline and diesel fuel transport. We do not have enough electrical infrastructure to switch to electrical generation capacity to fuel our transport system versus the most energy dense substances in the world for that, which are, you know, refined fossil fuels. Um, there is no battery powered semi to move stuff around, regardless of when Elon bought, brought that up, promised that it would go to market. It doesn't exist yet. And that's because the batteries are simply too heavy relative to liquid fuels. Um, for that to be viable. 
not to mention things like climate impacts on that and how those batteries don't function as well in the cold or the availability of cobalt and lithium to even build the batteries in the first place. So there are a whole lot of supply constraints around us going to 100% electric that are simply not acknowledged when the government talks about you know, priorities and incentives when green folks start talking about that shit. Now, if everybody had a solar roof and then you know they could charge their own Tesla off their own electrical base, that'd be great. I mean, go to Germany. Uh, they've given all sorts of tax write-offs to people who wanna put up um, solar cells on their roof and have gotten huge uptake with that. And that has probably allowed them not to build a number of energy plants. Uh, it also just so happens that's the highest cost of electricity in the uh, Western world, I believe. So you've got some give and take on this green stuff, and I wouldn't discourage anybody from getting your own solar panels going, uh, you know, reducing your electrical footprint, reducing your carbon footprint, um, walking somewhere, riding your bike somewhere. Um, riding a horse? Yeah, do it. Horses fucking love it, um, you know, and then burn the dung right like let's let's get all the calories we can out of these horses so there, there's a lot to do here and elong has long been a meme lord and over promised and under delivered on things uh and run on government subsidies so i appreciate his meme power I've, I've acknowledged him for a long time as a meme lord and i can only blame myself for not noticing that he was going to literally get doge to a dollar which has yet to come but may still come um you know i held for a long time if if elon himself championed bitcoin he could get bitcoin to a million dollars because there is a subset of the populace like definitely noticed amongst say teenagers and, and young kids that e elon is magical e elon is the the steve jobs to that generation Elon is stepping in where the government no longer provides services to do things like go to outer space, uh, talk about putting people on Mars, you know, just revolutionizing things in general. He has become the brand of techno revolution and is worshipped as such by many. So if anybody could single handedly get Bitcoin to a million, you know, Elon could come out and be 10 times as effective at that as Sailor just because he is known uh, as, as a techno king. Now, for whatever reason, he's decided that's not the way he's going to play it. And th this kind of feels like a Donnie Trump or something saying, we're going to get out of Afghanistan and then getting all the pushback from military industrial complex, et cetera, from the, the, the Russia's paying bounties to kill our soldiers kind of thing to Thank force you. him back from that position. He, Elon is acting in public here like he's been forced back from that position because why else would they have bought in Bitcoin? It, it's not like that's a trivial decision for him to make over there at Tesla. And they knew they had surely done all the due diligence you would on Bitcoin before you bought that. So, and it would have taken a lot of effort. It would have taken a fair bit of convincing, etc. So to walk that back so quickly, inside of what, two or three months, um, pressure has been applied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can be one of the richest people in the world and your free speech is still cucked. I mean, like, dude, Bitcoin was their play to have a war chest if all the magic subsidies disappeared. I mean, like, that's always what that was in my head. But I mean, it's like, yeah, um, they make all their fucking money from carbon credits. And like, even if you did snap a finger and replace every car with Teslas everywhere and put charging stations everywhere, have fun. 40% of that is powered by natural gas, 20% by coal, um, only 40% of it by renewables. So how, how did we fix the carbon emission problem? Hmm? You need a bunch of new nuclear plants to honestly do it. Either that or a bunch of new natural gas plants. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. People are really mad about all this shit, but I 
I guess I just, my expectations and appreciation for him were, like, just low enough that when this happened, I wasn't surprised. And I'm honestly not that disappointed because being disappointed means that you have expectations and I did not have those. So I, like, sure, he has a lot of money. He makes some things that people like, and that's fine. I don't really appreciate much of what he has to say. He, you know, he likes to play the punk by smoking some weed on Joe Rogan, but at the end of the day, he's just another guy getting government subsidies and with his military industrial complex connections with like all the PayPal people, like none of these people want a actual open free financial system because they built the opposite of that years ago and all of the force supporting what they're doing and their power and everything is the opposite of what powers bitcoin so i like sure he can play games with the marketing but at the end of the day i have no confidence whatsoever in someone like him being able to do anything for bitcoin oh we've only gotten through one of the the shits janine there, there's still more <laughs> like like this oh, next God. one please um, th this next one um see the geometric energy corporation is announcing a dogecoin funded mission where spacex will will launch a microsat in the first quarter of 2022 to orbit the moon and quite literally put a physical dogecoin on the moon and guess what? SpaceX, or SpaceX is accepting Dogecoin for payments now. So that's right. SpaceX taking Dogecoin, funding space mission with Dogecoin. Dude, they're literally sending Dogecoin to the moon. I mean, like, how, how could you deny now that, that Dogecoin is going to supplant Bitcoin, eat the global economy, and take over everything? I'm literally sending a, a real Dogecoin all the way to the moon, guys. Like, we're, we're going to win. The memes are thick. Just like, like Jesus, like, and the the fact that with all the carbon emission shit with Bitcoin, it's a proof of work coin that actually has ASICs and a sizable, um, you know, energy consumption. Um, like very, very hand wavy figures here, but I think, um, it was like a 10th or a 20th of Bitcoin's um, cost to 51% attack it for like an hour. So you're, you're, you're like a 10th to a 20th, very, very napkin mathy of, of the energy consumption. And this, this, is, this is what he's fucking memeing with, with Bitcoin. Oh, he's talking to the Doge devs um, that don't exist about increasing the system's efficiency. Oh, what are the Doge? What are the Doge devs doing? Hmm. Oh, they're going through the code base and replacing all mentions of proof of work with proof of wow. Comp real, real, real smart guys. Awesome. Let's go change all the variable names and make it way more difficult to rebase any important security fixes or features or anything from Bitcoin Core or, or other Bitcoin related altcoins. Real, real nice move, guys. Let's let's just rename some variables. Much dev, very smart. Such wow. Oh, also, mm -hmm. what's Elon's thinking here? Oh, we'll, we'll just speed up the block time 10 times. Um, so six second block times. Um, increase block sizes 10 times. So it'd be like a 10 megabyte block. And drop the fees 100x so that there are 10 megabyte blocks spitting out every six seconds, literally so fast that no node could download and ver or verify the blocks You know, as fast as they're coming in. So you would completely break the consensus on the entire Dogecoin network and make it impossible for all nodes to wind up on the same chain tip. Real fucking smart guy, Elon. You are a regular Einstein. Oh, what, what was it, the last meltdown that I saw before we started recording? Oh, hey, cryptocurrency experts, in quotes. Yeah, um, the other people besides you, Elon, actually are experts here, not a retarded clown. Um, ever heard of PayPal? It's possible, maybe, that I know more than you realize about how money works. No, you don't, Elon. You're a fucking clown. 
<laughs> you, you have no idea what you're talking about. You are a fucking media-driven, meme-lord fucking jizz bag who thinks that because the media fluffs you up every fucking you know week or two about how what a, a smart, modern, corporate genius you are, the, the fucking real-life uh, Tony Stark, um, that he can just figure out anything in, in like a week or two because he's a fucking genius. No, that, that's not how reality works, moron. So um, I personally... As much as it would suck, would probably fuck all kinds of people just blindly following him in this. Go do it, Elon. Like, actually do this. Throw some money behind this. Hire some devs. Let's see you implement your fucking retarded genius ideas on Dogecoin and completely break the entire network. Please, publicly demonstrate to all the people following you what a fucking epic retard you are. Please do. I'm torn here. What I'm if torn he... between what him if... wanting to prove that all cryptocurrency is a joke, which is a very much establishment narrative, and he's got about the widest platform to discredit cryptocurrency in general to the world, versus he has the biggest bag of Doge personally that anybody has. And that he simply wants to drive the narrative that Doge is an actual legitimate cryptocurrency. Yeah. I mean, dude, with this Doge shit, honestly, um, I, I don't even know what to think anymore. He, he's that fucking stupid. Like, he actually just thinks, I am Elon Musk. I can glance at anything in two weeks and comprehensively understand it. Or, like, he's just a fucking scamming greaseball. I mean, this is the kind of person you get when you just surround yourself with yes men who think that you're Jesus. So, yeah. It's apparent that the stock market has treated him that way, just on Tesla's multiple. Tesla being worth, I'm, I'm trying to remember what it was worth in its heyday. It was like the next six or seven largest car companies in the whole world. Car companies that actually make profit and post it every quarter. Car companies that ship 100x the cars that he does, but because he's a techno king and clearly a meme lord, he got a valuation like that, which makes absolutely no sense, which kind of goes back to how fucked the money is, how fucked the whole financial system is, etc. because that valuation is stuck around. And some of that is just smart people playing with options and pushing the market to that end, making the market buy it so that they're covered for their long dated options. So I, I don't know the exact root of it, but he definitely is used to getting praised and uh, you know validated every which way. Mm -hmm. but, but I mean, like seriously, please do this, Elon. Like, please try to make six second 10 megabyte blocks on dogecoin please like I, I i was looking for a new comedy uh, you know i'm i'm just at the point of re-watching the same shit on all the streaming services now I'd, I'd like to see something new and funny i i'd appreciate it elon if you would actually sell out your bitcoin position sometime soon uh, I think that would make a great buying opportunity for anybody that wanted to get into the market before we go do our thing, uh, before the banks show up, maybe late summer, and start offering people Bitcoin-denominated accounts. Uh, it, it'd be a great time for you to sell. Yep. Even better, he can put his uh, private keys for his Bitcoin on an open dime, give it to me, and that will use no energy except for the cost of the energy to get him here because I'm certainly not going to where he is, but we can do a completely uh, carbon-free-ish transaction. He should just burn it to protest. He should publicly burn the keys like they burnt that Banksy to make the NFT. Protest, Elon. Stand up for the environment. You know he Maybe he could send it to the moon. Send it to the moon and then dare somebody else to go pick up the open die. <laughs> Don't you like that? That's like an X prize to get to the moon again. That's literally what I was going to say. <laughs> I like it, Elon. I dare you. That would be like the best X prize ever done. Oh, yeah, because you not only have to get there. Well, 
I guess you could just take a USB port, read it, and actually, uh, you know, cache it on Earth. Or else you'd have a very specific open dime, you know, popping robot that would get the private key off there. Well, maybe he should just, maybe Rocket Boy should just run home to Amber. Huh? Oh, you don't, you don't remember that story where he kind of had a side gig with uh, Amber, uh, Johnny Depp's ex-wife? Well, who wouldn't? Um, people who don't want to be with crazy aggressive people? Don't know what you're talking about. Maybe. Who make up stories? About how the shit that they did on the bed was actually their tiny dog. <laughs> that that's the real Doge. Woof woof. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're talking about some imaginary people who don't exist, but uh, it's in the court documents. Please go all in, Doge, dear Elon. Please do it. I dare you. Get those shit coins. Alrighty though, I think uh, if you guys got nothing else to say, I'm done with Elon Hour. Finally. I just want to say, no matter what I said about Elon, I respect you, Doge devs. <laughs> if you exist. So let's see. Next story. I actually got paywalled out of this, but I can do this one from memory. So uh, UBS is the latest large-ass bank now saying they are exploring ways to offer crypto investments to rich clients. So if you happen to be a rich client and UBS happens to be your uh, investment manager of choice, someday they say, you will be allowed to buy Bitcoin through them, probably in a managed account that makes them several percent a year. Yeah, that is I mean, all. you've, you've uh, already made a bad choice. Make another one. I, I'm just going to mention to all the rich people out there that I know are listening to this podcast. One of the nice things about Bitcoin, in case nobody's told you, I'm sure your investment manager hasn't told you. I'm sure they've told you it's very hard to custody Bitcoin. Here's the deal. Bitcoin is a bear means you can go to one of these magical funny money places that I'm sure your broker would prefer you avoid called an exchange. And you can send what is known, at least colloquially in the United States, a Fed wire to the exchange for just about any amount of U.S. currency that's denominatable. And then you can change that U.S. currency into something called a Bitcoin that comes also in, you know, basically any denomination you want up to around a trillion dollars. And then you can take that Bitcoin and you can store it for yourself in a very secret, magic, random number. And, you know, it's it's very easy to do. It's, it's probably easier than I just let on. And uh, you could cut all of those fees that UBS or Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or whoever's busy charging you cut every year, you can take all those out of the equation. So not only do you get number go up, you also just uh, cut back on your management fees, um, which compound every year, by the way. So uh, just think about it. Again, um, DMs are open. So... If you I don't have it. like, sorry, just real quick. If 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 you don't have like some very specific reason, like money in a fund that you get penalized for pulling out, or money somewhere that you can't legally just get your own fucking Bitcoin for, then what are you doing using a product like that? It's just a magnet effect. It's where they had money and where they're comfortable with and. Maybe they even get taken out to lunch, you know, get a little handy from the receptionist. I don't know how it is to be rich. I'm sure it's amazing. But uh, I just thought I'd throw that in there in case you guys don't know how easy it is to be a dirtbag. I just wanted to suggest that the show title for today be Elongate. Yeah, I'm sold. Next sold week, show. Gatesgate. <laughs> Elongate to the moon. So what's up next? Well, 
In episode 266, I covered Binance's hiring of OCC regulator and former Coinbase legal chief and a side health expert amateur person, Brian Brooks, to run their U.S. branch as CEO. And I think we all know that these kinds of hires have a purpose other than whether the person in question is competent to act as an executive of said company, but rather to get a bit of regulatory pad in case there's any scrutiny or trouble. And unsurprisingly, on May 13th, it was reported by Bloomberg that Binance, the uh, not the U.S. subsidiary, but the proper finance, received inquiries from prosecutors within the Justice Department's Bank Integrity Unit, which probes complex cases targeting financial firms and investigators from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Seattle. The scrutiny by IRS agents come, uh, also uh, was involved, and that apparently goes back months with their questions signaling that they're reviewing both the conduct of Binance's customers and its employees. Uh, and Bloomberg claims that this came after a chain analysis report that alleged more funds tied to criminal activity flow through Binance than any other cryptocurrency exchange. Um, in response to the article, Shengpeng Zhao tweeted, uh, the news title is bad. Article itself isn't so bad, actually, but who reads? It described how Binance collaborated with law enforcement agencies to fight bad players, but somehow made it look like a bad thing. Thinking face any, <laughs> sorry, I just read an emoji because that's what happened. Anyway, so thinking face emoji. Anyways, back to work. Um, so yeah, he just wants to let you know that they are on board with responding to these inquiries and there's nothing wrong. Um, though there was also an article published by Colin Harper via Coindesk the day before about how Binance US users are having their coins stuck in limbo for unclear or unstated reasons for quite a while now, and also users of Binance Australia. Uh, this says, many of the affected Binance users flagged for risk management and anti-money laundering AML uh, hold accounts that are fully verified given that Know Your Customer KYC verification processes is a risk management process to prevent money laundering. Binance's stated purpose for freezing these accounts leaves unanswered questions. Um, yeah, so I don't know. The... Brian Brooks hire seems like uh, kind of exactly what I thought it was intended for. Uh-oh. I would expect U.S. regulatory agencies to continue to pick on China's biggest exchange. It just kind of makes sense, um, especially when they're offering things like tokenized stocks at this point. Uh, I suppose if you can argue that your KYC is good enough, that there's no US people, et cetera, trading on them. Like you kind of have to fuck off as the US regulators, right? Because you're not offering a security to US people. So you kind of don't get to regulate that. But that doesn't mean you haven't inspired their ire, which may mean they pick on you in other ways. Yeah, I mean, do, <clears throat> the US does not like any of these exchanges where it seems like there is any kind of looseness or selective attention or anything with KYC protocols. Like they're, they're going to fuck with those places till the end of time. Yeah, it's just going to happen. And as more big exchanges crop up, as more people go to cryptocurrency, as there's more options outside of the U.S. system, maybe in Singapore, maybe wherever, uh, I would fully expect U.S.-backed authorities to continue to pick on just because that's what they do. Mm -hmm. All right. Ready for the last one? Oh, yeah. Pie charts galore. So Tether, had, wow, hold on one second. My browser is, re there we go. So they have released the first itemized breakdown of their reserve portfolio. And um, but let's just say if you actually use or hold Tether, um, not really something in my wheelhouse to make definitive statements about. So I would just say investigate this more yourself and consider the risks of each part of this portfolio. But um, pretty much um, 1% is being held in um, digital tokens. Um, I'm assuming likely Bitcoin would be the logical thing there. Um, 
a little less than 10% are in corporate bonds, um, mutual funds, and precious metals. 12.5% um, are secured loans, um, none of which to a subsidiary. So it's not like Tether loaning money to Bitfinex again. And 75% is cash, um, cash equivalents, other short-term deposits, and commercial paper. And so here's where things kind of get a little weird, for my opinion. 65% of those cash equivalents are commercial paper. Um, so this is pretty much a, a deposit or a loan or what have you with a commercial bank that is not secured. Like they are not bound to treat that. They don't have the same like responsibility as just depositing money. 24% are fiduciary deposits, um, a little less than 4% is cash, 3.6% um, repo notes, and a little less than 3% are treasury bills. Now, I have seen a lot of people who I've known in this space for years, um, financially minded people, very successful traders, look at this and um, kind of go, what's the big deal here? Like, this is a normal structure for a fund like this. Um, and I'd like to point out, you know, some coins like um, Gemini's stablecoin, um, they don't even tell you what the split is between different assets, which I think in their case is just outright cash and treasury bills, according to them. But, you know, Regardless of the fact that a lot of financial people in this space seem to not find an issue with it, despite Caitlin Long taking issue with that, despite the fact that the market has not really reacted, like Tether is not crashing under dollar parity because of this, it's still important to think about the fact that those cash equivalents, 75% of that is a counterparty risk with other entities. So, I mean, clearly the market doesn't really care. Um, a lot of the really OG traders in this space don't really care, but that is still something to consider if you're actually going to expose yourself to Tether or hold a massive amount of it. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I don't really, really the only kind of thing at the end here I can kind of make sense of is I think something could be gleaned here um, because they're going to be doing these reports regularly now, um, depending on whether this allocation in the portfolio stays this way or say potentially the percentage of commercial paper starts winding down into straight up deposits or treasuries or something. Um, but you know, I, I really can't make much of this other than <clears throat> here is all the risk basket in this. Um, if you interact with this, be aware of that and make your own choice. But it seems like the market doesn't really care right now. So Tether is a trading sardine that represents a US dollar. So the reason you have that is so you can interact with US dollars online. So to some extent, you don't care what's under the covers as long as everyone else considers it a US dollar that you're trading with. So that's kind of a starting point. I think what started to get people a little bit were things like they mentioned precious metals as part of their 10% bucket, which is interesting to say the least. Uh, co commercial paper being 65% of their 75% essentially cash-like position is definitely interesting because I, and part of this is Tether has grown so much over the last year and year before that, um, they've always had issues getting bank accounts. So I guess I was kind of under the impression that they had way more bank account money than anything else. Whereas we learn here, it's 25%-ish of 75% of their assets, which is not so much of their assets, are actual bank dollars. Um, those bank dollars are then backed by either reserve dollars that sit at the Fed or reserve dollars that sit at whatever central bank 
uh, they might be involved in or are backed by treasury bills that a bank owns due to them having those bank dollars. So those fiduciary deposits are approximately treasury bill like. The idea that they only have 3% in treasury bills implies that they can't get exposure to more, to me anyway, in that treasury bills are about the best approximate approximation of the US dollar you can get and still have some positive yield on them. You can get them in three months. You might be able to get sub three months now time frames. You might be able to get one in two months. Um, and you know you can go all the way out on the curve. They're doing reverse repo notes, which is interesting in that that's high yield loans to other banks at the Fed discount window. The idea that they even have pushing 4% in cash those are hundos on pallets in somebody's vault, which is fantastic that they can have more hundos on pallets than they have in treasury bill exposure, but somehow they do. It's the 65% in commercial paper, which is a highly liquid product, but any of those have a very different risk exposure than having a T-bill on your balance sheet in that you're quite sure the US government will always honor a T-bill with whatever they call a US dollar at the time, just because they can, whereas commercial paper can actually go bad. So I, I think my take home from this is I expected them to have more bank account money behind this than ultimately showed up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like if, if this slowly doesn't adjust over future declarations down the amount of commercial paper and start increasing deposits or T-bills, then at that point, either something is a major roadblock in them doing that, or they just don't care and they're yield farming. The good side of this is those bank deposits, probably that cash, the T-bills, et cetera, those are all highly liquid assets. So if they ever needed to redeem Tether for dollar equivalents, wherever you can do that, they, they have plenty that they can do in, in that form, right? There's only 25%, it looks like, of their sheet that is definitely longer term assets that have maybe time to redeem, maybe uh, exist in illiquid markets, that sort of thing. Um, so that's good for them. And I'm sure that commercial paper is liquid also. So they, they might be balanced well there. But I, yeah, I would echo the same sentiment. I'm surprised they haven't found more banking that allows them to be in dollar denominated explicit um, yeah, U.S. Treasury liabilities. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, yeah, I mean, nothing really much to do except see what the next disclosure looks like and how much has changed and see how the uh, tether market reacts. Just do want to say, though, this is a far, far cry from just printing tether out of thin air. <laughs> the next <coughs> who just magically became active again yesterday. Yep, they definitely have a giant pile of assets, it looks like. But yeah. Let us see if the original stable coin can continue to survive. Final thoughts time? I have one. Go! So my favorite tweet from Dan Darkpill is still from last year where he said, how about you set up an autonomous zone in between your ears, dipshits? And I feel like that is something that I want to say to a lot of people right now. Got anything for us, bud? Uh, financial advice, Elon, please uh, sell your Bitcoin while you can still get out of it, buddy. Um, I, the market can do funny things, and I want you to be profitable. So uh, get rid of that shit while you still can. Also, there's a new BIP88. Yeah, I saw that. That is actually really fucking awesome that that finally got merged. A new standard to stop the derivation path nonsense that plagues this space. Well, guess my brain is kind of fried because I have to go kiss bureaucratic ass in a second. So, yeah, I think I don't got one. Have fun. I will not. I hope you punks enjoyed. Catch you later. Peace. Bye. Hey, Lord, we're standing here in